the oh DVS one interview. Let's talk about this quickly and then we'll end from there. DVS one, one of my favorites, uh producers, DJs out there. And again, somebody that always gives some very insightful interviews. And um, he gave this very cool interview. This photo is very chilling. I'm getting something on screen, but this photo looks super scary. But anyway, he gave a very cool interview with um, DJ Mag recently. We don't really do the best editorials out there, but, you know, they can sometimes dabble in the good stuff. But he kind of spoke about a lot of things I've been thinking about when it comes to DJ and it comes to, you know, um, the art of getting better. And he made some two, uh, two points that I thought really stuck out with me. I'm going to try and get them up here on screen. And we're going to quickly go through them before I have to leave. Um, so this is the first bit I thought was very interesting, right? Let me see if I can find this quote. DJ technology is amazing. Uh, da, da, da. So um, to give you a bit of context about this, I think DBS, DBS1 has been known um, or DBS1 or DBS1 has been, partic- has been known for being a staunch defender of vinyl, right? Or staunch defender of DJing the quote-unquote right way. But in recent years, he's sort of softened up a little bit his approach and he essentially stands in the kind of lane of like, technology is great, CDJs are great, looping is great, sync is great, but you have to use it more, you have to use, you have to push it to its limits as an artist and not just use it as a function to transition to one song to the other song, which I agree with. I think sometimes if you look at some of the bigger DJs from back in the days, and even someone like a Ricardo Villalobos, who's not the most adventurous anymore with these kind of transitions, but he even... Like it's a it's a workout on the decks. Like they're really working. They are messing around with the EQ. Like look at someone like a Jeff Mills, right? There's a famous video of Jeff Mills. I'm sure you guys have definitely seen it. Let me see if I can get it up on here to give you an example of what I'm talking about. But I'm sure most DJ fanatics are familiar with what I'm talking about. But you know, it's any excuse to see Jeff Mills, uh, you know, fuck around on the decks is very greatly received. Let's see if I can get it up on here. Come on. Maybe I've got too many screens open. Let me see if I can take away some of these stuff. Get this screen off as well. And this one's. I definitely have to go and increase my RAM. I think I'm affecting the way that I use the internet now with the staunch defense of all this. But anyway, let's continue here. So yeah, DVS One has. Um, so Jeff Mills is a good example of a DJ that has. A real cool way of doing it, advisor, right? I think Res Advisor did a really cool art of DJing with him to kind of kind of show you uh how he does it. There's two videos. There's this one is where's the infamous one? Um fuck. Okay, let's just play this one anyway, regardless. Let's just play this. this is Jeff knows the mixing on Res Advisor. And you see how hard he's working behind the decks, right? Every single minute he's tweaking the knob, he's messing around with stuff. Now again, most of it is nervous energy and just the way that he kind of does stuff, right? He's always sort of touching and feeling stuff. But I like the fact that it's an actual, it's a workout. He's actually working the decks. He's actually, what what you deem a, uh, a disc jockey would be doing behind the decks, right? Making, kind of crafting a sonic landscape through the tunes that they're playing on the turntable at any given moment. It's not just an exercise of mixing two songs together. You're sort of like, you know, using bass lines, melodies, and different parts, so especially on three turntables, and melding them in together into one different little soundscape. See that? Look. Oh, so beautiful. Anyway, so that's what basically he was um, speaking about. Like, if you're going to use technology, use it to the fullest extent, and then kind of like push it to its limits. Do the things that we couldn't do with vinyl with tech. So I like that he softened his stance about it a little bit, and he has a very interesting perspective behind it. He says the following, right? Let me read it from I think this bit. Uh, la, 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 la. Yeah. So um. Searching, loathing, searching, floating, and running. Sorry. Um, so, DVS One is a realist and a pragmatist. Uh, pragmatist. While some simultaneously holding, I'll link it in the show notes for you guys to read it yourself. I'm going to quickly read out this bit I like. Um, while simultaneously holding onto plenty of youthful idealism and faith in the simple power of sound systems, a bunch of people and kick drum, and the kick drum SOS isn't about rallying against change um, or looking for the past. Um, it's an evaluation of the past two decades where we've seen a digital revolution in music. In tandem with the increasing commercialization of dance music and DJ culture, it's beginnings of a plan to protect the culture and think about our collective future, which is great. 
if there's a sense that something has been lost during these last few years, then it's something intangible and hard to define. It's how you feel when you invest your time and effort into seeking out the very best of something, which we all should be doing. The thing that you really speak for. And this authenticity is very much where SOS is focused. But our instant access digital culture has more obvious effects, uh, not uh, least of which is the fact that current software and hardware have made being a DJ extremely easy. Another repeat topic that DBS1 has strong opinions about. He says the following. Everyone can do it and it's everywhere, you know? Everyone can go online, download the quickest um, DJ software now. Everyone can press sync. Techno is played in every clothing store and every elevator and taxi cab. The dropping of the barrier to DJing has allowed many who otherwise wouldn't be able to do it, which can be viewed as a positive or negative depending on your opinion, but it's inevitably devalued the craft while contributing to an expressional growth indeed, which is true, right? It happens all the time. The, 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 the fact that podcasting is so easy has invited everyone else to start a podcast, which means there's a lot more podcasts that suck. That's not to say in the beginning when it was hard to do, it wasn't a lot of shitty podcasts out. Cool, there was. But for the most part, the amount of hurdles you have to jump over just to get your stuff on an R or just to get an RS feed in the beginning probably would have um, immediately kind of uh, rejected a lot of people, kind of turned them away. They would have been like, you know what? It's too much effort. I can't be bothered. But the fact that you can essentially, you know, start a podcast via an Anchor account on Anchor app, you don't really, you know, it kind of effectively invites the whole world um, into the podcasting world, which then effectively slows the innovation because everyone just does whatever the low hanging fruit is. Um, and it's happening a lot in the DJ world. Now I feel like there is a bit of a shift. I feel as if like the consumer is savvy enough to understand where they need to go if they just want, you know, commercial hands in the air we don't care sort of rah-rah DJing and also I think consumers are savvy enough to know where they could go somewhere where it's going to get a bit weird it's going to get a bit, get a bit freaky the stuff that you're going to hear is going to be a bit different the people around you are going to look different than anyone else you've seen in your life and I think people like that mix I don't think there needs to be an either or there just needs to be an understanding that that is one thing and that over there is another thing and you have to decide as an artist yourself where do I sit where do I sit I don't think you can sit in both I don't think it's advantageous to sit in both. I think it's you, it's good to have the ability to play for both, but you shouldn't sit in both. You should be in one camp. I'm going to be over here on this side with the artists. I'm going to be over here on this side of the commercial ability of it and the fans. Up to you. Um, it continues here. Um, Divis is the following here. Tenonji is amazing. There's so many options, so many possibilities. But what's shit about it is that everyone's using the presets. It's like going to a studio, buying an amazing keyboard and never getting past the presets or going deeper into it. People talk a lot about record collection and my vinyl purism, but I'm not against technology. Actually, this year, I went almost all DC DJs to my gigs. And if I'm going to use technology, I'm going to push the boundaries of technology. I'm going to use multiple decks, effects, and everything I can to push myself to my limits and to go past them sometime, which I agree with. I think for me, it's been a bit difficult, especially in the places that I play. Most of the systems I use, the mixers are just, just about working. I can just about get the channels to work, just about get the EQs to work as intended to be. The moment I press the flipping effects button, everything kind of distorts. It gets all weird. So I don't necessarily use the effects to a certain extent, but I have started mucking around with the loops a little bit more. I've gotten a bit adventurous with this way that I phrase songs in, what I loop, what I don't loop, how I mix. It's not just simply cutting out the bass and fading in the other song. I'm trying to do stuff a bit different. Maybe for 30 minutes, I'll just mix in with the highs only. I'll maybe mix in, you know, um, maybe on a, off a four beat count just to kind of make stuff a bit more interesting and again th those are things that i'm doing myself purposely at this lower level so that i know that suddenly when i get the opportunity to play at a higher level i'm definitely going to bring my a game um and this is the following uh the evaluation this evaluation of djing uh, to an art form is key to understanding uh, devious on position on the other contentious dj talking point cameras in clubs and raves he's spoken in the past about Bergheim's ban on filming his personal preference of a no phones dance floor and about how to translate the values of tolerance and diversity into actual real life or real world strategies or guidelines including that including what we might call phones in clubs etiquette which i agree with right we're never going to get a full ban on phones in some places because I think for all the people that love the Bergheim, which I do, I'm a big fan of Bergheim. I just have to look at my channel to see how many times I've spoken about Bergheim in Berlin. I know that there is the same amount of people who criticize and blame and get offended or get annoyed when the Bergheim rejects them or doesn't let them in. And they also get annoyed that they can't use their phone, right? You're effectively telling somebody that's born in the year 2001 or 2000 or 1998 who's known nothing, who's known, who hasn't known a life without a smartphone, right? Where I'm old enough to be in, in a generation where I've used the Nokia. I've used all iterations of mobile phones in that regard, right? Especially the modern day ones. So I, I know what life was like before having a mobile phone. I know what life was like having to carry around a digital camera 
and a mobile phone, right? That was the life that I had, especially when I was going around doing the whole vlogging and blogging thing. Um, I had a digital camera that I used all the time because my phone camera wasn't up to par. So I know that life. So if you tell me to like not have a smartphone in the club or on a dance floor, it's not that big of a deal. I can do it for an hour or two. But if you're somebody that's grown up, effectively come out of your mother's womb with a, with, a, with a device like this, it's going to be quite difficult to do. So I kind of get that. Um, but I think what you can do is enforce the dance floor etiquette. I think that's a good idea, right? The idea that you could have... The idea that you could have um, some kind of rules and regulations around how you conduct yourself on a dance floor with your smartphone is great. Maybe the fact that maybe there aren't no the phones on the dance floor is a probably a good idea. So you're not bashing into people and dropping people's drinks or stepping people's toes. Um, and then maybe if you want to take pictures out away from the dance floor, fair enough. But once you come on the dance floor, the dance floor is for dancing. I think I think I heard people say that before on their flyers and shit, which is a good way to go about things. Um, it's not as far as Berlin, but I think as a culture. You know, when you go to Berlin, for the most part, even just regular bars that aren't Bergheim, people don't use their phones and take ma ma pictures or, you know, they'll have their flash on and stuff like that. They're just being courteous to everyone around them and not trying to... Because that's the thing with phones. It takes you out of the environment. It takes you out of the moment. You've ever, have you ever been at a table even with friends and somebody's using their phone? It just suddenly takes you out of it. You're not really having a conversation anymore. You know what I mean? Um, anyway, it continues here. Um, there are, of course, those in club land who feel the current etiquette of cameras in the clubs is patronizing and overly serious in a scene that's supposed to be fun. After all, techno isn't your dad, but perhaps this issue of cameras becomes more acute in the more purest areas of dance music, where self-expression might have cut many forms and where freedom is directly related to the short anonymity and safety. In this context, the reason camera phones have caused such contrition or consternation in techno culture is not difficult to understand. Techno generates energy at the point of contact. Its power lies in the ability to create community in the moment. A techno record has no influence when it's sitting on the shelf waiting to be played. It can only work when its magic is activated in real life, which I 100% agree with. But attempted to create and document uh, something that is very nature uh, here and now we limit it put a frame around it attempt to freeze it in time and uh, because techno is pure true power to lift and unite and exist it now which i agree with i think that's why i've tried to i'm, I'm contemplating starting an instagram account sort of like to, to kind of latch onto my zine i had a zine that i produced for a while i'm probably going to do it now anyway fuck it, i'm just going to do it um i had a zine that i had previously a physical one that was called creeper creeper zine that i put out that essentially I collated all these images from around the world, no, from around London when I was going out and exploring London underground warehouse culture and stuff. And um, I used to post them. I used to kind of, you know, print them, put them in the zine and hand them out to local record stores. And that was a great time. And I loved it. It was a great experience. But over time, I stopped doing it, right? Because I felt as if like you couldn't necessarily capture the magic. It just got a bit strange. But I think what I might do nowadays or going forward is that I might actually, because I think, it's hard to capture the feeling of being in a nightclub and listening to somebody shelling and listening and interacting with somebody really cool and just being in that moment. It's really hard to kind of capture it. So what I might do now going forward, especially what I'm going to do, sorry, is I'm still going to produce a physical copy of the zine. I'm going to hand it to record stores and stuff. So if you're in a record store, you'll be able to find my zine and take it for free. But I'm also going to have the ability to have a smartphone and use my smartphone in clubs and obviously have people send in their clips of them at amazing parties and upload them onto the Instagram stories of that um of that of that um app that i use so of the instagram account that, ha that i have right so you'll be able to if you're at the particular underground place and you want to send in a story of what you're doing there you can tag me in a picture and i'll kind of repost on my story and i also have my ability so then effectively you have all these different people around london or around the country um sending in their clips of of their shows and stuff and then they'll have the ability to have people post up their flyers on that account it'll be a really cool immersive little kind of account that people can kind of post on and get familiar with and again, it will just capture the magic of the community because I don't think you can capture the magic of a record of what it feels like to be in situ with these different people that share the same experience of you. But you can maybe capture the kind of the community that involves yourself around it so that next time, because I think what it takes is one picture for you to go like, you know what, I want to go to that event. You see one girl that looks like you. You see one boy that looks like someone you want to you talk to and suddenly you want to go to that event. So maybe just having some record of it is important because again, I don't think we can do it in London or in the UK. We're just not built the same way as and other european cities are where and it's, again when you go on holiday you're a bit more detached from your phone you just want to experience it it's a bit it's different it's not the same as being in london we just can't do it people are just a bit too ingrained in their phone i look at fold is a good example fold has a no photos policy but i've seen pictures of fold all over the place right people are taking videos at fold people are doing photo shoots in the smoking area you know it doesn't work in, in the uk for the most part um ba -ba 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 -ba. uh 
uh, so contrition but I tend to capture there now. Um, the scene is at its le- at its best when the entire room is active, participating and locked into the moment. Phones and cameras and social media they're linked to can draw people away from those communal uh, moments. Reasserting the ego wish to document, record and share. If enough people are on their phones, it can generally kill the vibe, which I agree with. Uh, and how can a club be a site of freedom and expression if people are self-conscious about being filmed or photographed, which I definitely agree with. I think that's probably the the, the kind of beauty of a place like a Bergen or clubs in Berlin, for instance. It's like they are, in all intents and purposes, the definition of safe spaces. Now, it might be difficult to get in. There might be some discrimination involved before you actually enter the space. There might be some... Um, rules you have to abide by what you wear what you look like okay cool but once you're in there it's safe as hell people just let you do what the fuck you want right apart from you know taking drugs on a dance floor you're free to do whatever you want like literally whatever you want which is amazing to see um it's notable that dvs1 doesn't see the current phone in club culture as kids these days generational critique we're all subject to the enticing warm glow of our phones and the inviting calls to narcissism offered by the various social media platforms very few of us are immune for the cameras, from the charm, sorry, even as we observe the damages wrecked. Uh, DVS is the following. In the last 20 years, we were handed technology like phones and never told what to do with it. I've seen many 40-year-olds abuse their phones and social media. It has nothing to do with age. It has to do with the fact that they don't have any thought about how those things are interconnected, which I agree with. I can almost give more credence to young people. Uh, than the old ones because i think the older guys should know better the young people have grown up with it but the reality is that we are all insecure human beings and we've all been handed something that magnifies everything we do and are our insecurities our positivities and our negativity so definitely definitely check it out um i think it's a really cool interview very in-depth and again gives a good idea of what he's about as a person i definitely recommend you check out some of his interviews that he's done previously especially one he did about just the art of DJing. I like the fact that he's promoting that. Um, I think he's doing actually a conference that kind of celebrates people just learning. I think he's he's fed up of going to conferences where they're talking about marketing yourself as a DJ and there's no real um, education on like how to get better as an artist, like what where to go to look for songs, how to approach your DJ sets, none of that stuff. It's all about what hashtags to use, what what time to post and stuff, which is not the important thing because you need to get better. You need to get sets and reps in. You need to be playing out regularly in front of different kind of crowds. Uh, mixing up the stuff that you play, mixing up the order you play them in, your approach to DJ needs to be completely different. You need to kind of commit yourself to it hundred percent, and then maybe over a period of time you can then become an overnight success and become you know the next devious one. But to suggest that you can cheat your way through it by using hashtags is kind of ridiculous. But you know, 